Welcome back to another amazing episode of Open Relationships Transforming Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller. My amazing co-host, Joanna, is off today. I'm joined by our awesome producer, Brian Adkins. And the conversation that I had with our guest today, Logan Cohen, it got emotional and real, real fast, way, way quicker. Logan, he's just this incredible man, and I'll, I'll tell you more about him in a moment, but I invite you in to this very intimate discussion, talking about the chaos of growing up with um, just a, a, a lot of trauma, uh, addiction, and so forth, um, and there is a, there is a silver lining um, how you can come out of it, because when I think of Logan, he is a like a poster child of someone who went through just massive trauma. And he, uh, this dude's living his best life and he's got a lot of great advice. Uh, so let's uh, introduce Logan Cohen. Ooh, I am so excited to welcome one of my new favorite people. His name is Logan Cohen. He is a licensed marriage and family therapist, as well as a supervisor for the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy and the North Carolina Board of Licensed Professional Counselors. Over the past 12 years in the field, he has dedicated his practice toward serving community members who are in need of emotional and psychological support. Logan is also the author of the amazing book, How to Human Up in Modern Society, and is a superstar on social media with around 2 million fans on Instagram and TikTok. And maybe you've surpassed 2 million since I wrote that down like 20 minutes ago. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because you're growing fast. Uh, congratulations and welcome, uh, Logan. Great to have you here. Thanks so much, Andrea. Happy to be here. Of course. Okay. I mean, holy smokes. Your grandpa Sam was a Holocaust survivor and was on Schindler's list. He was saved by the incredible courage of Oscar Schindler, one man. Um, he lost his parents. I think it was six siblings who died in the Holocaust, and yet he came to America and built a life of service and was a hero to you. I mean, your grandfather, uh, excuse me, experienced unbearable physical and emotional suffering, and yet he was your hero. So, I mean, it's an incredible story. What'd you learn from him? Hmm. What did I learn from him? A lot. Um, I guess primarily how how much um, influence and strength there is in in service and in in staying patient and kind in a tough harsh world i mean even mm-hmm. as you start talking about him and and as ask me questions about him the audience is going to start hearing my voice cracking yeah um if you're like mm-hmm. watching this on video you'll see my eyes glazed I, I over. Feel it. Mm-hmm. yeah um it was a really big part of my life growing up uh, i grew up in a pretty chaotic and dysfunctional household and he was just down the block uh the six houses down you know quite literally it was one story where my younger brother was having an asthma attack and uh we didn't have any inhalers at home for whatever reason and there were no other there were no adults (laughs) and i like got the keys to a car that was at our house and literally drove down there i think i was like 10 years old or something wow (laughs) um the inhaler was down there and little brother turned out to to be fine and got stuff figured out but their their home was a refuge um you know for for myself especially mm-hmm. well it is i mean it, just reading about him and you know when you talk about how he would um meet you know you grew up in um downtown atlanta by the way i i grew up in marietta right so it was like ooh, cool. you know we're, we were like out in the we we're in the you know kind of out, outcroppings <laughs> i it's remember in the 80s and, you yeah. know kind of in the 80s and 90s what it was like down there and just you know um cool and and you know pretty intense uh 
and to hear you talk about how he would help homeless people and like with so much dignity. I mean, it just, I'm like, we all need a Grandpa Sam, right? I mean, we all need a Grandpa Sam in our life. Yeah, I, th I think we do. And unfortunately, American culture is so rooted in a capitalist economy, which is assumes that as, as long as you cannot be productive in so far as making money, your usefulness plummets. Mm -hmm. And as, as a result, we just we have very little respect for our elders in in, in, in our society um, compared to a lot of other places. And which is really unfortunate because to live a long time and have a lot of wisdom, even if it is rooted in totally different you know, social or cultural circumstances than we're familiar with. Totally. In fact, my husband always says he's from India and, you know, which is very different from America. I mean, I feel like Amer Americanization is is uh, or hege hegemony is is kind of taking over a lot of places. Um, but he always talks about what a gift it is to, you know, have communities where young kids and and the elders are mixed. Right. And, it, and in America, it's like in the best school districts, the taxes are often higher. And a lot of the older people want to leave because it's like, why am I paying those taxes? Right. And yet it's still such a it is it is so important. I feel like especially for I mean, for for all of us. I mean, I you know, as I mentioned to you, I, I'm a mom of two. I wish my, you know, my parents live in Florida. Uh, it, it just you're right. I'm totally with you that not only is there a I feel like lack of respect for so many of the elders in our society, but it's such a missed opportunity as families trying to raise young kids to not have, you know, just to, to not have them close and have their wisdom, you know, and a lot of obviously older people, they're retired, they have the bandwidth versus us. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not a young parent, but as a, as a working mom, like it would just be so helpful to have, you know, my, my parents or my husband's parents close by, but you know, but but yeah, but you're right. That's capitalistic society. Unfortunately. So let me ask you, um, was Sam your mom or uh, dad's dad? So Sam was actually my mom's stepdad, interestingly oh, enough. Okay. Um, my oh, okay. You got a bonus. You got a bonus grandpa. Boom. Got a bonus grandpa. Lucky Logan. My, um, and her, her biological dad was actually a, a gangster in the Jewish mafia. What? Um, Hang on, in wait. Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> this was not in your book. That was not the part in the book. that I got to. Not in Holy the book. smokes. Um, and the the so they they were constantly he was constantly in and out of jail. Um, oh was my god! Really abusive. Um, left quite an imprint on my mom. My mom had pretty pervasive no, no. mental health issues that she had. Pretty limited lack of self awareness uh, around no. and kind of. Uh, uh, bled all over all the, the folks around her, proverbially speaking. Proverbially speaking, mm -hmm. um, and and he died when when I was a baby. You know, heart disease, not taking care of himself over a prolonged yeah. period of time. And then Sam came into the picture when I was a toddler. Oh, lucky you, and lucky Sam. I mean, here's the thing about the elders: it's like they need to be needed. I always remind i I try to remind myself to ask my dad for advice. And now my mom's uh, at a different phase in her life where giving advice isn't, I mean, but even before she got into dementia, it was like, Andrea, rem my mom was a, like a really wonderful designer. It was like, remember to ask mom what she thinks about whatever design thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's just a small, small sure. gesture. And it, I, as I love to say, it's like it is, um, it, it, it is overweight in, in the impact, right? I mean, don't you think? You know, for us to to make sure the I mean, for the elders to feel needed, right? It's uh, there is a an academic, uh, almost hundred years ago now, named Eric Erickson, oh, yeah. uh, who came out of psychodynamic theory, it talked about this as a need for generativity with the next generation. Um, and it really aligns with how Joseph Campbell talked about the hero's journey as well. And with the stage of uh, finding the elixir and being able to bring it back home, um, but it, it part of what creates a, a lot of meaning for folks who get older is mentorship, and 
knowing that there are parts of themselves that will still be here when they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I feel like with me and my, you know, at times with even with my dad, I just, you know, it's like I'll ask for advice, but at times I'm like, dude, be more, you know, like be more present in the boys' lives, right? Because that is just, you know, so my boys are 11 and 14, the greatest kids ever. And, cool. um, I mean, I always call them my little Buddhas because they've taught, <laughs> they teach me a lot. They, they find my pain points, right? That's, that's the whole point. And it, so, yeah, it, it's a, it's a great reminder because at times I've, you know, my, it, it's really hurt my heart for the, for them not to get more of that mentorship from my dad. Right. And I've, I've felt like, oh man, I need, you know, if he's not going to do it, how can I be more proactive, right. In kind of fostering that connection, because it's like, you know, that when when you are an older person and you're help you know especially helping young kids and oh my god it's they're so easy to delight the little ones right they're so easy to to delight it's like instant it's like instant karma instant gratification so i'm 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 going to see what i can do it, it is not too late but okay so going back to your your mom and you talk a lot about the the chaos and the heart and the heartache and i, I just want to say like props to you dude because y- you've been so brave in talking about your hurt and heartache and your journey and what you've overcome. And clearly you've taken grandpa Sam's message of service and purpose and, 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 and being there for other people. And so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, So thank you. Um, But I I would love to understand, you know, you said your, your mom and wow, like I never even heard of the Jewish mafia. So like, that's probably a whole other podcast. Like, like we talk about that. But what what happened? I mean, growing up, was it was it? I mean, and I come from a family of alcoholism and addiction and so forth. So I'm you know I'm curious because in you know in in listening to you and knowing how what just getting a sense of what you've gone through, I'd love to understand in a little more detail what it was like for young Logan growing up. What was going on? Hey. So. My dad probably worked 12, 16 hour days, five or six days a week. Um, oh, so you got work, you got workaholism. He and I could relate. <laughs> like, just that. like, been there, just done that. that, trying to recover. Very, okay. Very, very busy uh, mm-hmm. fella. Um, it's yeah. kind of how he managed anxiety that I learned to, to recognize when I was later. And also, kind of look to appreciate him just kind of feeling out of control with all the other parts of life. Um, and which left me and my brother home with, uh, my mom, um, most of the time, which is pretty, it's a cultural norm. Yeah. Um, in, in our society and and in many others. And she was, uh, had several different addictions. Um, um, Different diagnoses would be uh, uh, overheard, you know, at different points. Calling it bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, um, and medication really didn't work. Um, and she was just incredibly erratic. Um, very little structure and in any structure that was there was like submission rituals oh, essentially shit. uh-huh um and, and she, hang on submission from her to your dad or for you to her or or like everybody or anybody is, around her oh crap okay okay got it that, that's kind of how she would control her environment and control people mm-hmm. um and hang on, but she would be submissive or she would expect you to be submissive? I mean, both she are... Would ex- she would expect others to be submissive and she okay. was quite domineering. Ah, uh, okay. Um, okay. And and by the way, the opposite would be bad news too, right? Then you learn, you know, like that, like that's a form of control too. Ooh, poor me. Totally. Take care of me, you know? Right, totally. And and um, and and she, and sometimes like she would... Uh, she was very fond of kind of playing the the victim and scenarios that that she would create, and then it would become other people's job to take 
care of her and over function for her. Mm-hmm. Um, while she remained under functioning and controlling and dysregulated and telling herself that everyone else is the bad guy for different reasons and would create these different coalitions and, and groups of people that she would bad mouth to each other. Um, I remember like the narrative growing up was that my dad was controlling and mm-hmm. I, like, I never like saw it. I never quite got it. And then I, as I got older and like, started studying this stuff, I would just catch her in it mm-hmm. and really awkward and weird. Um, both experiencing it as a kid, as well as, you know, as a professional later going like, Oh my gosh, like you're, you're pretty twisted up. Um, and yeah, her, her favorite. So I I would be grounded, like kind of just like sent to my room, um, isolated for really prolonged periods of time. Um, months at a time, like as a, as a kid, as an adolescent, I'm so sorry. Appreciate that. It's, it's also where I fell in love with books. Uh-huh. I fell in love with playing music. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah, as, as well as, uh, gosh, she she was one of those also like really controlling, manipulative, dysregulated uh-huh. people that uh, she was very bright. And when she got her her master's degree i think in like school psychology and before i was oh my God, born the oh my gosh which is unfortunately more common than you might think because mm-hmm. um, people like try to conceptually understand something as a way to control it a, right. as well i mean they know they're not okay they're not. right so i'm yeah, not they, okay right so what do i do totally, like try to learn totally. and try to be okay try to make sense of it and mm-hmm. she worked in group home settings a, a good bit as as a young adult and she would use the same type of structure in those really punitive settings structure in, mm-hmm. in like you know the 60s and 70s in our home that's all she knew how to what to do mm-hmm. so it would be a lot of like putting dish soap in your in your mouth and extra points if you do it yourself right oh, it was God. again like part of the submission ritual you just go away faster um and you know, it started as like you know, profanity or whatever. And, like I've got an eight-year-old son, and like constantly experimenting with what can I get away with and whatever. It's not like being mean or trying to be a problem. It's just experimenting yeah. and seeing what works it's and what being, doesn't. It's being a child. Yeah, hundred totally. percent. It's being a child. Part of being a human. Mm-hmm. And um, by the time I was like eleven or twelve, I became physically bigger than mm-hmm. her. And there was one uh, episode where she was kind of like cornering me as she would do, just to like trap me into a Mm -hmm. space and, you know, either go into scolding for prolonged periods of time Mm -hmm. until I would fold in or do the other like dish soap stuff or Mm -hmm. stash me up or whatever. And Mm -hmm. at at, at that point when I was bigger than her, I was basically just like refuted, refused to be herded around. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was one episode where, like, you, you will respect me and, like, had the dish soap and, like, pouring in my hand. Like, you will put this in your mouth. And I just remember being like, I don't respect you because oh, you haven't earned shit. my respect. Like, and I'm not even going to say that I respect you because this is ridiculous. And, like, fuck this dish soap. Oh, like, I'm not God. doing this either. And, yeah. um kind of just like push past her and and went outside and I mean, she called my dad and like you're gonna be in for it when dad gets home kind of yeah. thing he came home and she described what happened and they fought for a while um Boom. and uh, <laughs> that was it and, and then like for a while after that whenever my dad would come home from work like he would essentially like have to walk me around the block a few times just from being so like dysregulated being around her um yeah it was it was a trip really really out of control um a very you know dysregulated low functioning person on these the kind of power trips that weren't making sense that i would be the primary scapegoat for and it was messy Oh my God. Well, I mean, honestly, thank you for, for sharing that. I just, my, my heart aches for you. 
it's not all relatable, but a lot of it is, honestly. Um, is your mom still alive? She's not, actually. When? She passed away a little over a, a, a year ago. Oh. Yeah. Do you forgive her? Did you Did you guys ever reconcile? I tried lots of times. And it would always end in... A re- so the rec- first, I forgave her. Mm-hmm. What what I think forgiveness is actually supposed to be. Mm-hmm. We never mm-hmm. reconciled. Um, anytime I would try to have a real conversation with her about stuff, it would end in power and control tactics. And like, I'm sorry you feel that way. And just not being able to be accountable and look she at herself and her role in the problem. No. Mm-hmm. Um, and like many people who live their lives that dysregulated, uh, she developed... Uh, chronic neurological decline and she was also in denial about that I remember 10 years ago seeing her not track something very well when mm-hmm. I was visiting my parents and kind of going to my dad afterwards going you know like you need to get mom checked out there's something else going on there mm-hmm. and and they did and and like she insisted that we're only going to call it mild cognitive decline and that's what they called it for the next 10 years until um she started having significant psychotic breaks and developed dementia. And, um, and it's, um, you know, she eventually passed away just from sheer failure to thrive, just medical fragility in her early seventies. It's not supposed to happen like that. But when, when you're that dysregulated for that long and, and fight or flight that constantly for that period of time, Um, you know, Buddha said many years ago that holding on to resentment is like drinking poison and expecting it to hurt the other person. And that, you know, I've seen the biological manifestation. It just, it looks like someone in fight or flight for that long and your circuit boards just get fried. Those, um, those circuits aren't designed for that much amplitude and voltage that frequently. Mm -hmm. And they they can only do so much. And, and, And they did. Um, my version of, of, of forgiveness, how, how I would talk about it is, and, and conceptualize it, is accepting people for who they are and appreciating whatever little positive pieces that you got to have access to or develop through encountering them mm-hmm. and creating a different set of boundaries or you know rules about how much access they get to have to our time resources and energy so that we Mm -hmm. don't have to hold on to resentment towards them yeah well let me ask you did you or do you feel empathetic to her like sincerely empathetic because this Mm -hmm. lady suffered i mean holy crap did treat your kid like that miserable life yeah miserable life um do feel empathetic towards her. I also grew up kind of bringing her primary like emotional companion. Mm-hmm. And it just got, I got so burned out on it. And I, I realized that empathy towards her subjective worldview was dangerous. Mm-hmm. I empathize with her experience as I observed mm-hmm. it. And mm-hmm. knowing how difficult it was for her as an organism, as, as a human, as a being. Mm-hmm to be here um mm-hmm. I, I, I don't necessarily empathize with how she saw things because they just yeah. didn't make sense and it was a, a weaponized a lot like i said i mean amen to you logan for what you've gone through and how you've used your life in service um and and thanks for sharing that because i, I think a lot of people listening are like oh my god i can relate and dude thanks for telling the truth that that's all we got <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's yeah. and by the way, here's my my take. It is so much more valuable than we realize, right? Because it's hard to tell these scary truths. Sure. And 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 yet it's. I mean, ta- you you know, you talk a lot about service and purpose in your book and, and in your work. And to me, like you are walking the walk, and and that's awesome, right? Because let's face it, <laughs> there are a lot of people that are big influencers on TikTok and Instagram, and you know, and they're proselytizing and so forth. And, you know, it's good just to see you're, you're legit. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks um, for asking pertinent questions. Yeah. Well, and so as a big, so as a big brother, you, you had kind of 
I don't want to say a double burden, but like almost like a double burden. Did you feel like you had to protect your younger brother? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did pretty well. Mm. Are you guys and close some, still? We, we are, let me, we, we have a lot of similar interests and we mm -hmm. like, uh, we grew up playing music together. We grew up snowboarding mm -hmm. together. We grew up going to a lot of, you know, live shows and the early music festival days together. Um, and so we, we still really enjoy doing those things. We also mm -hmm. have very different world views. Um, mm -hmm. And that's okay too. Uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. we're we're buddies. I mean, he was yeah. we were the best man at each other's uh, weddings. Oh, and nice. if you look at us next to each other, like he's a lot darker because he's a mm -hmm. little bit of a in, in jest we call him like more of a throwback Jew. Like he looks <laughs> much more Middle Eastern. He could go um, into the Jewish mafia. Is that what you're trying to tell yeah. me? <laughs> <laughs> go into like in Turkey. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Um, and. Uh, and, and we have a lot of similar mannerisms and word choices and, and inflections of, of tone and, and, and mm -hmm. timber. Um, so you, you can, if we're next to each other and operating, it's it's pretty funny. We, we we don't look super similar. Okay. And and what's your relationship like with your dad? Because in a lot of ways, he seemed to kind of protect you, but also he seemed like kind of like an enabler for your mom, right? Oh, he totally I mean, was. he had a role. So, what, what's it like with you he guys? Totally Is... Um, we're we're tight. Uh, oh, we're, okay. We're, we're buddies. I, I um, you know, for, forgiven him for his mm -hmm. enabling and even like modeling that as you know what what mm -hmm. you should do and what being steadfast in a relationship is. Um, that, so I know that I got really caught up in, uh, in, in my early adulthood is being in relationships with really chaotic people. Um, oh, okay. We're going to come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> sure we will. <laughs> and I'm open to it. Um, but he, he has a lot more self-awareness. He is a lot more uh, willing to hear folks out and, and socially savvy like in the right way. I mean ways. when you say folks like like did you ever sit down and say like yo dad dude you fucking dropped the ball I mean maybe you didn't say exactly that but like was it was did you ever have that sit down with him yeah or or side by side or however dudes do it where you you were break you broke down with yeah. what what you know what what your experience was and could he hear it I did oh good and he for did. you what did that sound yeah. like I mean, what was that like? Because, and by the way, so many people need to do it and they're so freaking afraid and for good sure. reason, because that's scary. So, it is so scary. like, give us, give us kind of like that, that summary of what that was like. Um, I think it, it started with saying like, why, why did you partner with her? Like, what was that yeah, about? Sure. And you go. And then it got more into why did you stay? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Did are, are you aware that that relationship was actually really abusive? And mm -hmm. then you characterized the relationship that that we had with our primary caretaker as well. Like where were you? What were you doing? Um, and and and. In, in more words, but I guess the distilled version, sure. he basically said that he, he carried around uh, a, a list in his wallet at all times for the, the last 15, 20 years they were married of reasons to stay and reasons to go. Ooh, holy crumbs. Yikes. And that he was close to leaving several times. Mm -hmm. And it was a constant juggle between trying to figure out what the right thing to do was. And in the end, uh, he just ended up doing what he knew to do well as, as a provider and, and work a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and that he still yeah. wonders if that was the right choice. What do you think? 
I don't think I get to judge it. Oh my God, dude, you're like a sage. <laughs> That's a good answer. I mean, it really is. Right? Yeah. So it sounds like a guy that really was conflicted, had his own, you know, serious limitations. And and I, I'm going to project a little bit here. I, I'm guessing he he actually didn't really understand how bad it was for you and your brother. No. Or for himself. I mean, if mm -hmm. if you operate with someone like that in your inner circle, mm -hmm. to some degree you have to adopt their worldviews and their beliefs in order to function day to day. It starts to kind of look like Stockholm Syndrome. Um, and you know, a firm believer that people are always doing the best they can with what they got. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean they're off the hook for everything they do or don't do, mm -hmm. but I much prefer to live my life like that. Yeah. That, I mean, that Stockholm syndrome thing. And by the way, just, just for our guests, most people know, but what is Stockholm syndrome? Just like in 10 words or mm -hmm. five words. Where someone who is kidnapped um, takes on responsibility for the behavior of their kidnapper. And they almost like start to like relate to them, right? Like Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. So well, it was eventually, it initially came out in a, a high profile court case of someone who mm -hmm. was kidnapped. Mm -hmm. And I think of the folks who are like robbing banks or something like that. And um, there were times where they were leaving the hideout and going and doing everyone's grocery shopping <laughs> and errands and then coming back to the hideout. Mm -hmm. And they uh, had them on the witness stand. They were basically going like, well, you were just sort of being as bad as they were. Like you were sort of being a part of the problem. I don't think that this uh, witness's testimony can actually be used to charge these folks mm -hmm. and then they, they brought on a psychologist who started talking about these aspects of, of what happens we're about to, to talk a little bit more about it and they called it Stockholm syndrome yeah i mean but that it when i think about um i mean that's clearly an extreme case but it is such a a profound um reminder of just how how we are um social creatures and how we need each other and i think about so many kids that come from degrees of, of like the most extreme abuse, sexual abuse and, and, and physical abuse to, um, you know, mental manipulation and, and addiction. And, and, you know, for you, like, oh, like fucking col um, solitary confinement, right, as a form of abuse, that it's like we still need our caretakers. Right. And and that that that's a conundrum for for human beings. It is. Need, need our caretakers, need connection, and also need to be able to tell ourselves that we have control in our environment. Mm -hmm. is the, that, that's what sets animals apart from plants. Is we don't, we mm -hmm. don't have roots. We have choice. We have agency. So if you're going through enough trauma, in, which is really just a combination of two variables multiplied by each other, trauma is, is with uh, pain and lack of control. People mm -hmm. deal with an incredible amount of pain as long as they have control, right? Uh, oh. uh, monks can light themselves on fire in Tiananmen, uh, Tiananmen Square and sit in a, in a lotus meditation pose to protest the Vietnam War if they know why they're doing it and they have those incredible self-regulation skills that they've developed over you know, dedicating their, their life to them. Okay. Um, but as soon as you take away control, people's ability to navigate pain plummets. And so we're going through traumatic experiences, especially relational trauma, where someone else is abusing us. Mm -hmm. What the, the victim will do in that position in order to survive is tell themselves that they have a lot more control in mm -hmm. a role, active role in what's going on than they realistically do. Mm hmm um, whether that's internalizing responsibility for the abuse, you know, uh, um, it is happening because I'm a fundamentally, you know, bad little boy, bad little girl, bad mm -hmm. wife, bad husband, whatever. Um, as well as accepting the abuser's worldview and beliefs and assumptions, because that's how the survivor, the, the victim in that cycle of abuse is going to 
manage the dysregulation of the abuser. Right? If, I, if I can just kind of like stay on top of this tension building fight phase, we might never get to the outburst. That's what you do get to control. And eventually you start believing that that's your responsibility. Well, and then the people pleasing starts, right? Then it's like if exactly. I can be be a good be that good girl or be that good good boy and help keep mommy or daddy um, calm then then not only do I get control but then then I, I get credit right mm -hmm. and you can see how that can become really toxic and how you can take that from childhood into into adulthood in in way you know in, in ways that are so dehumanizing I mean I it, it honestly my story isn't that extreme but it doesn't need to be that extreme right to be to be trauma maybe with a little t right doing a lot of that freaking people pleasing and mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's something that you've you've talked about i mean how have you broken free of that um probably first and foremost it's going to sound at first like it doesn't make any sense um but, but like dedicating life to service mm -hmm. and on the surface that sounds like being a servant mm -hmm. being a servant is not service yeah 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 but gotcha. certain service is like an empowerment Mm -hmm. and, and and learning how to do that and being out of my comfort zone constantly and thinking about, okay, how can I make the next best decision to empower this individual while also maintaining my own safety? Um, you can't people please if you're doing that. If, 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 if you're going to be able to provide people the mental health treatment that they need and also keep yourself from burning out, and focus can't be on what do I need to do to placate this individual. Well, I think of it as like, sorry to interject, but I think of it, I've really, I mean, especially the last handful of years, I have really um, asked myself if I'm in integrity. And mm -hmm. only I can answer that question. And if I'm people pleasing and, you know, and, and doing things kind of the easy way out, I know I'm out of integrity. But to your point, integrity and empowerment go hand in hand. Right. So so to me, Absolutely. being in, it's like people will be like, oh, well, you know, like if you're if you're in service to people, you're a doormat. And I'm like, no, it, it's 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 actually the opposite. And, and in a way, it is like the ultimate control. <laughs> right. Because you're doing it on your terms. Right. But with a I mean, again, for me, when when I think about really saying to myself, am I integrity right now? And sometimes I don't give myself the right answer. So I'm like, shit, I got to get integrity. Right. And that I mean, like that that to me is the litmus test. And only I know, but nobody yes. it, who cares what other people think. It's not about anybody else other than me. Yeah. And, and um, the, the, that is a, a huge, a really important question to, to be asking ourselves as we go throughout our day, as we go through you know, our weeks and experiences that we're having is what what am I doing right now? And does it meet? the core values that I have, how, how I know I need to operate to be Logan, mm -hmm. right? to, to, which is not necessarily a body. It's not, it's not the feelings I'm having. It's not the thoughts I'm having. It's mm -hmm. who it's my higher self is who, who mm -hmm. I know I am with all of those together and how I flex my own agency muscle mm -hmm. in order to empower myself and empower those around me to the best of my ability, leaning into my, knowledge, gifts, resources. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it, it's impressive. Um, you referenced, uh, I, I, I didn't get it maybe perfectly, um, but just having come from the chaos of growing up and then uh, going into chaotic relationships, you're married now, as I understand, a yeah. son and then two twin girls. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, what, what, what has this marriage been like? I mean, have, have you, have you, really ha had to battle with the chaos or by the time you got married did you kind of iron all that stuff out i ironed uh the, my relational chaos i ironed most of that out before <laughs> we got together <laughs> good job good job dude high uh, five <laughs> right um and we we actually met working in a wilderness therapy setting together oh um, ooh, that is cool because you did that me. in your early 20s i did did it with 
three years and we, we came in at around a similar time. I was coming out of undergraduate school and she was coming out of Peace Corps. Oh, and wow. And it was oh, a cool. know, recommended um, job site for folks who are reacclimating to modern society, mm-hmm. you know, especially mm-hmm. if you're working in a more remote setting in Peace Corps like mm-hmm. she was. Mm-hmm. Um, and we saw each other date other people and like, we were just close buddies uh, mm-hmm. for a few years. And then, you know, eventually we started dating and she's definitely the healthiest, most regulated, most down to earth, reasonable, um, human, maybe that I've ever had the pleasure oh. of meeting. Certainly that I've ever dated. Love her. Been romantically involved with me too. Good job, dude. <laughs> Thank you. And so yeah. what, what about with your kids? Because I feel like, you know, as I've said now a couple of times, you know, my, my kids are my Buddhas. They're the greatest kids ever. And they've mm-hmm. taught me a lot. And, and I, I find my, oof, you know, at times I'm my worst self, not my worst. That's probably a little unfair to, to me. Um, or but they, you know, they, they can trigger me and, and then I feel <laughs> guilty and then it's like, shit, I know better. So do you have that experience or am I just, uh, like a, a dysregulated loser? <laughs> No, you're absolutely not, not a dysregulated loser. You, you sound like a, a human who is self-aware in parenting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I totally experience it. Uh, and every now and again, you know, my, my wife and I will kind of, you know, like, hey, yo, you know, I'm going to catch up with you for a minute over here in, in the adult circle. And, and I go, like, yo, like you're, you're coming in too hot. They can't mm. do this like that. Why don't you go take a minute? <laughs> you know, like remember this, how we talked about doing things. And we have a lot of experience doing that, you know, like from working in the woods together with oh, right. super right. chaotic relational groups. So the parenting and especially co-parenting is something that I mean, we're, we're I don't know, toot my own horn a little bit here like we're we're good at it and we're strategic with it and we can both be in the kitchen and not step on each other's toes we're a good Mm -hmm. team awesome what what advice do you have for me as a mom with two teen like very high energy uh i'm not gonna say out of control (laughs) very high energy uh teen boys what what do i need to do what's your number one advice well i guess First, the the boy centric part, um, especially at the age that you're describing, is like they're they're getting these huge hormone dumps mm-hmm. as their their body is trying to turn the organism from a child into a man. Oh, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and that involves mm-hmm. adding a lot of fast twitch muscle mm-hmm. to their body. Is that just okay? What... Hang on, what does that mean? I I kind of get what it means, but but sure. I don't totally get what it means. So when you like see people lift heavy weights in mm-hmm. the gym, that is fast twitch muscle. It's, oh, okay. It's muscle that is designed for power mm-hmm. to be explosive. Mm, okay. I didn't know what I, I didn't know. Apparently, I didn't know at all what you meant. <laughs> I'm glad I got no, the it's okay. Idea. So, yeah. so like if you can almost think about it like um, <clears throat> how a working dog. Mm-hmm. Mm like looks different and acts different than mm-hmm. a dog bred for family life. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and in many ways, men are the working dogs of the mm-hmm. human species. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we evolved primarily to, to hunt and go to war. Oh yeah. Okay. And with that comes a lot of the physical power that's, a bit different just out of the gate than girls and women. Now, of mm-hmm. course, you can go to the gym and like you can learn to add, like le- learn how to lift and do heavy compound movements and add mm-hmm. a little more muscle to it. There's also just going to be a, a limitation that you run into because there are not androgens. There's just not testosterone okay. there at that level. <clears throat> so these these you know, these little boys are turning into men these huge dumps of androgens, of testosterone, of human growth hormone that um, prone to uh, uh, 
making people more aggressive because people we we get to choose how we behave but it, it definitely adds a bit of, of more aggressive impulses oh my god I guess thank you, could you. Say. can i can i just say thank you like <laughs> i you're not honestly, raising the next serial killers don't oh, worry <laughs> yeah and and again i mean in fact some of the some of the um praise my kids get from their teachers from other parents right people outside of you know who are who aren't as biased as we are we'll talk about how kind-hearted they are how um just you know just gracious and polite and you know of course as flattering as a parent and i i say to my older son a lot i'm like dude why are you being so hostile like why are you being like what gives so are you telling me yeah. logan it's not him it's the and i've never even heard that term androgen so i'm gonna like throw that around <laughs> But androgen sure. sounds like like hormones and all the it, things that are happening kind of neurobiologically that it, it, would cause my otherwise kind hearted 14 year old to be. I mean, it's like we always hear it's like a, it's almost like a trope, like your 14 year olds are jerks. But but that's sure. that's it's true. <laughs> it is true. And, and it's they're yeah. biologically wired to be hostile and aggr aggressive, especially at boys. And it's not they, they don't get free passes to be mm -hmm. aggressive or follow their impulses. Mm -hmm. In in fact, mm -hmm. quite the opposite. They they need even more accountability around mm -hmm. those pieces and more guidance of what you do with it. But like, you know, make making sure that they're in sports and in, in yeah. contact sports. Like they, they need to know how to be overpowered and not come out swinging like you need to kill somebody. They, yeah. You have to learn how to cap drive. Oh, yeah. Right, just like like if you had a, a working dog, like a Belgian Malinois or a Dutch Shepherd or, or something like that, okay. something that the trainer is doing constantly with that dog is getting it to a very high drive state, mm -hmm. and then directing that drive into the desired activity, and yeah. not letting it redirect in in any yeah. kind of like antisocial way. So then yeah. that's where contact sports are are just are important because with the, there's a lot of privilege with having all that fast twitch muscle having all that capability for physical power mm -hmm. and with that privilege comes an incredible amount of responsibility to know mm -hmm. how to manage it um yeah that that helps me i i actually i did a tiktok on this recently i asked my son i mean we're super close and yet at times it's it's tough dude so i said to him we were both calm i said how can i meet you where you are when you're when you get like this and you're like so unreasonable to me, you know, because I'm I am a I'm going to say I'm a pretty good mom. Um, and he just he said when when I get like that, cause he's self-aware. Back off. Don't come into my room. Leave me alone. And in a way that it, it was a relief to hear that's like, OK, well, that's actionable. And then the other part of me is like, but 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 you're being so unreasonable. <laughs> like and so what I hear you saying, you know, and between him and you, it's like honor you know like i'm asking what he wants so for me to say but i can't do that like would would suck right that would be wrong for me as a mom to ask and then not honor it but it sounds like what you're saying is really twofold then for me to give him that space and then maybe to follow up and talk about the accountability and give him a sure. lot of put him into i mean and he is into sports let me ask you this what about my both of my kids play a lot of Fortnite. I mean, they're not doing like Gods of War, some of the like really gross ones. I've just said like, let's try to stave that off even longer. Sure. I've been okay with them and, and they play a ton of these competitive video games online, obviously, with um with their buddies, right? And so and it, it feels social. Sure. Right. And it's like they're screaming and it's competitive. Does that I mean and, and he does like if it were, if he didn't also do sports, I'd be like, dude, like let's dial that back. But I'm almost wondering if that's beneficial at their age to get some of that aggression out in a way that's healthy. What do you think? Or am I just rationalizing <laughs> Fortnite? No, I mean I, I think you're also just describing a cultural norm at this point. Video games yeah. are just that much more uh, prevalent, and it seems just getting more and more so. Uh, every kid is different. And mm -hmm. you know, like some some dogs can manage rough housing and then mm -hmm. cool down. Mm -hmm. Some dogs can't. They're gonna get agitated mm -hmm. and, and push the uh, put, push the limits. Um, I would what I would really pay attention to from your end is how regulated do they stay when it's time to get off. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, the, the best indicator that you can have as a parent about if your kid is getting compulsive about video games mm-hmm. um, is what is their mood like afterwards and after it's, it's time to stop. If, if they're uh-huh. angry and trying to be more combative with you, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. they're becoming compulsively focused on the video game. Yeah, it's, it's developing into an addiction. <clears throat> sure. The, the same way as if you were to redirect someone who has an active addiction from whatever they're getting compulsive about, they're, they're going to be upset with you and trying to take it out on you and trying to make it your problem. Um, mm-hmm. But if, if, if they can manage and stay regulated enough, then it's it's probably fine. Or it's not taking it, and they're, and they're not taking those mindsets and those actions into other areas of life functioning. It's probably right. fine. So the, the, the boy-centric part being, you know, give them avenues to learn how to come into their body. And also the, the, the other aspect is being very respectful and honoring vulnerable entities in their communities yeah um whether it's women whether it's less powerful men whether mm-hmm. it's kids um if, if you got a, a a mastiff and you want it to be really social it needs to know how to play with chihuahuas and yeah. you, you gotta yeah. keep them gentle and hold them accountable to that and teach them how to view situations from less powerful organisms vantage points and consider how that goes into being pro-social yeah. and like what is going to work and what's not going to work. Um, certainly spending a lot of time, and I guess, the, the, and this is the other part that you should, the, the one was the boy centric. The other part is just okay. for all kids. I think the, the dynamic tends to come down to at, at the foundation is avoiding punitive um, rules. So I get to try to avoid punishment as much okay. as possible. And uh-huh. instead, which is just the application of an aversive experience, the application of pain in order to teach them this comes with not fun, because it, 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 but it's going to come from you, yeah, versus logical and natural consequences mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. letting them make their own bed and then insisting that they sleep in it mm-hmm. and it be an experience that they learn from um this way it doesn't the natural consequences don't come from you at all logical consequences do come from the parent a bit mm. more but they're they're tied very rationally to mm. the the carrots to, yeah. to what kids like and what their privileges are, and they either earn access to them or they haven't earned access to them, and it's based on their own uh, their their own merit and their own like, you know willingness to to do things the way that they need to be done. And then on the other side, managing a healthy attachment with our kids, which is mm-hmm. the same for all kids, regardless of, of, of gender. Um, being really warm. Mm-hmm. Um, and affectionate, mm-hmm. um, using a lot of active listening with empathy and compassion, being highly attuned to when they're scared, hurt, or insecure. So, so that how they, do you do they... that with your? How do you do that with your son, especially if he's been dysregulated and he's totally pissed you off? <laughs> then what does that look like yeah. in in the Cohen household? So first, to take a really deep breath, mm-hmm. and acknowledge that I'm pissed off. Mm-hmm. And then remind myself that I'm a human and I get to be pissed off. Mm-hmm. However, in this relationship, it is also very sacred and privileged because I'm an adult mm-hmm. human and this is my yeah. child human. Yeah. So I need to kind of put the pause button on the pissed off mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and either save it for the gym or processing with my partner. Mm-hmm. And attuned to this little human's emotional experience mm-hmm. and start using all the active listening skills that I have mm-hmm. um, to help them frame up what their internal experience is so that they can talk about it so that they'll, they don't, they don't need to act about it. Do you, have you apologized to your kids when um, you've messed up? Daily. Yeah. Oh, good for you. I feel like that's such a gift to real for parents. And I, I, you know, some listening will be like, oh, duh. And then others, it's like, ooh, you know, back to your punitive, avoided punitive, punitive rules. Like it feels like there's still this kind of battle between 
you know, not, this isn't like necessarily like gentle free reign parenting and people like, ah, like, come on. Like, and, and some of that can work too. Like I'm not judging, but sure. it feels like there's a big, still kind of a disconnect between might is right. And, um, and I don't know, like, so when I just, when I hear somebody like you talk about, um, that you, you know, like when I ask apologies, you're like daily, it's like, oh yes. Like that's not a weakness. That's a strength, right? I mean, isn't that the whole point? Absolutely. There, there's, and it, it models that even the, the people that our kids look up to the most, mm-hmm. which is us. Like they can, because they can trust him, right? Isn't that the whole point that with that vulnerability, with saying yeah. I'm sorry and I screwed up and I'm human, it's like, okay, now I can trust you. It's real. And kid, whether whether you're willing to acknowledge when you mess up as a parent or not, your kids know. They know. And that's the they thing. Know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There like is not, no, you're not hiding thing, it. there is no hiding. <laughs> no. And I feel like that's, yeah. but that's that. Okay. So, so one thing I did want to ask you about going back because it's so relatable to me. Did anybody in your family tell you the truth about what was going on? Because that was one of the things when, as I grew up and I went through all this chaos, I just said to myself, you know, and I've, I've, healed a lot and I've done a lot of work but I think back and just go God, I wish somebody would have said to me you know what what's going on is not normal and it's not okay and like validating my experience versus feeling like I, I'm in this this chaos sure a- and everybody's pretending it's okay so did anybody do that for you yeah no I don't think so yeah um I, I had drugs and alcohol yeah <laughs> That's uh, yeah. That, that's that's how I uh, that that's how I I, I how you, muted yeah how you, how you my experiences it. yeah yeah and then but that's that's why I had drugs and alcohol too is well, that didn't have a safe space with co-regulation with adults yeah well and that yeah I mean so when I think about how how our kids uh, like you talk about that sacred bond I mean for me yes it's it, it's a disproportionate responsibility for us as parents. But I sincerely like when I think about how much my kids have taught me how grateful I am to get to, in a lot of ways, reparent myself by having them. I mean, you even say, I can't remember if it's in your book or in one of the TikToks or Instagrams that I watch about how like we shouldn't avoid our triggers, right? Because that's how we that's how we heal. But I, I feel like I am such a better parent for um uh, such a better human, rather, for having parented and feeling guilt and shame, feeling like I screwed up, feeling guilty. But it it feels like all of those 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 things that I've gone through as a mom have ultimately helped helped me see those parts of myself that needed healing. They they absolutely do. As as long as we remain open to asking questions and holding ourselves accountable. Yeah. Yeah. The holding yourself accountable, like to me, like amen a million times to me, it's being accountable and in, in, and in integrity is like those go hand in hand. And yeah, we can tell ourselves whatever we want, but we know the truth and, and our kids know the truth. So like the easier, like the path of like the sincere path of least resistance is like, just come clean, you know, like just come clean. It doesn't, you know, and, and by the way, I mean, you know, we talk about our nervous system and so forth. Um, I just, I feel like personally when I'm out of integrity and I'm, I'm holding on to blame or resentment or any of those icky feelings, I feel it in my body. And oh, it's yeah. like, I can't, I can't rest. Like, I feel like, uh, like, mm-hmm. you know, oh, let me go on a hike. <laughs> you know, let me try to, let me try to escape this. Like, mm, and then maybe it'll work a little bit, but really the answer is be accountable, come clean, I think. And uh, if... But we avoid it, right? Don't people avoid that shit like big time? And then, oh, then we wonder why we're sick. It's like it just becomes like that vicious cycle. So it's amazing how many waking hours a lot of people spend surface acting or just uh-huh. trying to be in in denial about how they're actively participating in their own suffering. And then even doing that adds another layer of suffering. Okay. Um, as it, surface acting creates anxiety itself. It creates cognitive dissonance. What do you mean by sur? I think I get it, but what do you mean by surface acting? Surface acting, um, trying to op, 
trying to do the things that we believe other people expect us to do or that we're supposed to do, mm -hmm. even when they don't feel right. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and there, there's that. I guess what I'm thinking in addition is just that um, not wanting to be accountable, kind of denying, it's like bl blame. Honestly, it's like, you know, something went down and I, you know, and I'm just so, it's so much easier to put it, put it on somebody else. Right. Oh, and I feel like true. I've, I'm guilty of that. I try to do it like, like when I get in that space, I try to call myself out and fix it immediately. But it, it's interesting how in city, to me, how insidious blame is and how it's a complete abdication of accountability. You, 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 you know, like, mm -hmm. you, 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 it's like, what, like, how does that help you? Like, it's so irrational and yet it's totally rational to me. It's a uh, good, good old egocentric processing. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it really lends itself to protecting denial. And mm -hmm. human beings use denial of what is, you know, unfamiliar or what is uncomfortable in order to tell ourselves that we're doing the right things. Yeah. Blame well, is, is a very common uh, way of doing that. Totally. What's interesting to me, in a way, it's like you you think everything is Darwinian and 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 everything is Darwinian. Like you like you can't deny it, but it feels like there are two levels of it. Where on the one hand, to be in denial and um, um, fob you, you know your own accountability, like. Like and like it's short, it's it's self serving in a really short term way, but the truth is, I mean, even as you write about in your book, um, you know, when we think about how much more communal and tribal so much of the world was up until the, uh, you know, and some of the world still is obviously, but when you think of the Western world up until the um, industrial revolution, that it's like when you need each other, then um, to be unaccountable, to be in denial ruptures the trust and that f's you up in the long run right i always say like play the long game play the long game right in our in our lives as parents as as workers anything like play the long game right it'll it, and if you do it'll all sort out i think but doesn't that seem like an interesting kind of conundrum between you know your short-term interests versus your long-term interests you know when you're when you're like you're going to fob accountability onto somebody else it um Yes, it can. It, it, it is in the long run, um, and and we also you know, live in a society that is pretty obsessed with the idea of happiness being like the smiley face emoji, uh -huh. and being yeah. like just this dopamine induced kind of state. Yes. Um, yeah. And that's that's not what living a satisfying or meaningful life uh, is about. So a lot. We, we get force fed these ideas that staying comfortable and keeping ourselves in dopamine as much as possible, as constantly as possible, is mm -hmm. what is going to make us happy when mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's all just marketing, <laughs> marketing, it's all right? Marketing. I mean, we, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, capitalism, you know, you talk about this too. I didn't realize, I think you said something like, um, the vast majority of businesses until like the late 1800s were family owned. And since that time, that number has dropped precipitously. And a lot of people be like, well, who cares? But the, but the truth is, I mean, the corporatization of America, is, I mean, listen, I'm a, I'm a capitalist and as an entrepreneur, proud and grateful to be an American capitalist. And yet you see sure. that ugly underbelly from like marketing happiness and what that looks like versus what it's yeah. really like like there's a like talk like about surf like surface acting that feels like a lot of capitalism you know just run amok you know and and sort of short-term quarter-to-quarter um shareholder interest versus saying hey mm -hmm. the greater good of society is to tell the truth about these things but that's why you and i are here yeah. right <laughs> trying Try. to trying to to be a, a you know sort of sole voices in a sea of Ooh, a lot of, uh, you know, trillions of dollars of marketing spend. But we do what we can, right, Logan? We do. Dude, 
how did it how did the time go so fast? I have like seven million questions still. So you're gonna have to come back. <laughs> but yeah, let let's wrap up. But there's there the work you do is is wonderful. And especially as a mom with boys, the um the 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 passion and the insight and you know, even how you know, I, I listened to how you, you wrote your beautiful book, um, as you observed so many of the um men young boys and men that you grew up with dying deaths of despair. And that motivated you to write the book. And I, and I thank you for that. I've lost two men that I'm close to um, who died by suicide. And I, you know, as that. a mom of young boys, it's like, ooh, you know, and, and it's like, it's such a conundrum. We've got male privilege on the one hand. And let's face it, we've been in a patriarchal world for the most part for a really long time. And yet the, the boys are, and men are not okay. And so yeah. I, I'm grateful for your work and right. your research, and I would love to have you back on the show and 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 we pick up from there because to me it mm -hmm. is, if the boys aren't okay, then the girls, you know, boys and men aren't okay, then the boys, then the girls and women aren't okay. Like we're in it together, folks. You know, and I know you That's know. Fair. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, Logan Cohen, you're awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Bunch. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh. Wow. That was amazing. That, you know, and it, it's interesting just how I, I really admire how um, courageous and open he is. And um, there really is so much more to talk to him about. But, but what a show. Um, Brian, do you have an actionable takeaway or is there an observation that you had that, you know, was kind of informative for you? Yeah, it's funny because he, like you just said, um, we should have him back because uh, I know he talks a lot about like wilderness therapy and stuff like uh -huh, that. Uh -huh. And and I, I going into it, I thought that's where we we're going to go. And then immediately it was like, wait, his family like was on the literal Schindler's list like that. It immediately went in a direction I was not expecting. And mm -hmm. it was wow. I'm I'm still like kind of I'm kind uh, of tingly, right? After such yeah. an emotional, emotional experience. Yeah, I'm with you. I well, mean, yes. Yeah, so, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, no, like um, uh, my girlfriend, soon to be fiance is uh, Jewish. And the the one type of, of movie, uh, media, anything that that she like cannot do like uh, emotionally is mm -hmm. stuff that relates to the Holocaust and everything. Well, for real. I mean, in a really, yeah. I mean, a lot of my friends are Jewish. We have Jewish relatives. And so, yeah, when I think generational trauma in the Jewish faith, the Jewish culture, it's real, right? And what's amazing to me in speaking with um, Logan is what he's done with that personally, right? He obviously suffered a lot as a um, a boy yeah. and young man. Um, and to see how he's turned that around is so inspiring and impressive to me yeah that's the other thing too is that it's like it's i know you talk about this a lot like um uh no i don't want to say anything about like being a victim or anything but like uh, i guess when we talked to martha mcsally and she talked about like using you know the trauma and stuff as as jet fuel uh, to mm -hmm. propel yourself forward and mm -hmm. it's like he's almost like taking that generational trauma and his own and then using it as jet fuel for himself and others so it's it's very commendable yeah, yeah. His whole point of uh, living a life of, of sincere service with integrity and accountability is is motivating. And for me, I guess the last thing I'll say with regard to his grandfather, Grandpa Sam, uh, Oscar Schindler, and, you know, even Logan, but the, the difference one person can make, right? I feel yeah. like we're in a society, it's so easy to go, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. It's like, you know what? If you are one kick-ass mom or dad or sister or friend or teacher with with courage and integrity y you punch above your weight dude you know what i mean that's what i'm gonna say you punch above your weight you don't even know it and that's what i'm gonna try to do brian how about we, we have a pact you and me we're gonna punch yeah. above our weights right one 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 individual try. each yeah <laughs> we got it Whew. all right well this was wonderful thanks for tuning in to open relationships transforming together we would love your advice and feedback. You're welcome to email us at openrelationships at your tango.com. We would be super grateful if you subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. We are working so hard. We're putting our whole hearts into the show because we believe so deeply. In fact, we know 
what an impact these stories and advice and our personal experiences can make. And so we're so grateful that you tuned in and uh, we hope to see you on the next show. Thanks so much.